welcome everybody. Um, it's already the 11th. Dev recap, as I was saying, next one will be an one year anniversary. And uh, today I'm hosting our good friend Claudio is out of office, enjoying the company of his nice son. And um, we can already start. We have a rather short one, uh, I think, I believe this time. Many people were concentrated on experiment weeks, projects, and gearing up for ECC, which is just around the corner, and working on some longer term projects like Dave, and modularity stuff. Uh, but with no further ado, let's start. Uh, Karsten, would you like to talk? There's some interesting developments going on the co processor work front. Please, Karsten. Okay, as a start, uh, do you see my screen? We do, at least I do. Okay. Back. For some reason, it takes ages. So, some of us recently in the experiment week have been talking about loving Linux, uh, but here today I am talk, uh, going to talk to you a bit about uh, how I love the idea of having Linux as a coprocessor. And what is a coprocessor? Uh, so one of the things that's kind of like going on in uh, the Ethereum space is this thing called Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer basically allows you to take F that is staked and restake it, as in put it to at risk in multiple uh, systems. And because of this, it's basically possible to very easily construct, let's say, crypto economic systems where... Uh, let's say you don't need to have an independent token sale or marketing or even a business department or something like that to kind of launch cool new proof of stake protocols. And one of the kind of like the subset of uh, things that is possible on uh, this kind of thing is the concept of a coprocessor. A coprocessor is a little bit like how we have been doing it with Cartesian Compute in the past. Uh, where basically instead of focusing on rollups, you kind of like have a piece of computation that you need to do, or you kind of like do it off chain computation, and then you get the, re the result back to your smart contract. Coprocessors in Eigenlayer is a little bit different uh, because there's this thing called crypto economic coprocessors. It's basically where there's a large amount of stake uh, for everything kind of like node that's participating in the system, and they kind of come to a consensus. Go ahead and vote. If two thirds of the node weights uh, come to a particular computer result, this is kind of like what then is the computation result. So let's say if you need to come, let's say compute the square of something, that basically you would have a, let's say a bunch of nodes called operators in the eigenlayer. Basically, go out and compute these, and then basically return it back with a signature. You then combine these signatures together with something called aggregation. Uh, which is then something you can basically then settle based on the fact that two thirds of these nodes are kind of assumed uh, honest, that uh, then settle back into Ethereum very, very quickly. And this is something we've been playing around for a while for those of us, uh, for those of you who have kind of like followed Cartesia for a while. Uh, and recently, uh, Eigenly has finally gone to mainnet and kind of like opened up the whole, let's say, the spectrum of enabling these services to exist, which are called AVSs. So um, moving forward a little bit to kind of like understand what is kind of like the dream here. Uh, of course, now we would like to change our habits, which is why that we are looking at uh, using Lambada stack to leverage Cartesi CLI, where basically you can do what you're doing at the moment, Cartesi create, Cartesi build, Cartesi run, Cartesi send, where let's say instead of sending to a blockchain in this particular case, you basically send a particular payload that then gets executed on this particular compute job using a local Lambda container, for example. Uh, so it kind of like feels like something where it's quite straightforward and just like deploying, let's say, sending your input to a different target. Uh, Agilely, the examples that we're using are very, very similar to the ones we have for rollups, except that there's no inherent state because it's kind of like a stateless function that we're kind of executing. And Agilely, we are also able to then do something like Cartesi Deploy onto a coprocessor, packing this uh, function that we have made into an IPFS bundle, upload somewhere. Then basically after that, what can, you can then do is that you can register a particular computation you want to have done, saying you point to this thing in IPFS, which is our program, 
together with a payload. The payload and the program get kind of like anchored into a blockchain so you can access the entire history of uh, Ethereum using this, for example. And basically, the moment that the, all these nodes are kind of like replicating your computation, you can then take this and use the result in your smart contract or other software for that matter. You don't have this typical seven day waiting period that, uh, that a fraud proof game would need. And essentially, it's running in this kind of like Lambda style function. So, um, this is something we're kind of experimenting with, the kind of like a different way of using the Kitesse machine and a wonderful development experience. And kind of like the plan here is that, that uh, we have, as of uh, let's say a, couple, a week ago, we have done our first test that uh, operator and kind of like deployment. And what we're going to do, uh, because uh, where the testnet for Eigenlayer is at the moment is kind of like the Holisky testnet, and it's not very friendly for kind of like developers because there's no layer tools or anything like that, we're kind of going to deploy kind of like testing in production. Uh, mainnet uh, deployment of this probably here in July. Uh, we have tested already on mainnet fork that this kind of works. We're not going to move on to kind of like having small uh, sets of operators, a small set of operators that then have kind of like committed a little bit of economic value and so on. We're going to go through a security audit and then kind of like go ahead with uh, the full blown crypto economic security or something like. Uh, I can like an offer and then move on eventually to the picking for example slash with Dave. One of the kind of like topics that we're looking at is how do we take this value that's being proven to a layer one? Uh, how do we bring that to layer two, like Arbitrum or Optimism or even another Cartesi roll up? How can we deal with payments of this computation? How could you do with soft sampling? Because obviously you don't need always to kind of like go out and ask 200 nodes. Sometimes you can just ask five at a random and that's basically good enough. Insurance on the computation results, and there's kind of like a lot of open questions we still have about this, like the downsides. Can we use stuff like computer on the day for this, co processors, and so on? And yeah, this is kind of like just just wanted to kind of talk about what we are playing with that kind of like enabling, and just to show one last thing, which is this uh, Holoski transaction hash, which is basically us kind of like settling uh, a computation result into Ethereum with a bunch of aggregated signatures and basically you're then able to use that as a smart contract. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of like presenting a little bit about what we're doing with co-processors. Great stuff. So reminding everybody uh, to post questions on the chat so that we can answer them at the end call. I have a couple of questions myself and I'll keep them to the end as well. So please, people, uh, think about this. It was very fast, Carson. Um, there are many, many things uh, that I'd like to ask, but uh, we can go back to this after everybody presents. Thanks a lot. That's very interesting. And lots of potential. All right. Um, so following suit, I believe, uh, Next one here would be um, dev ed team. They have some some wrap ups to do about lots of projects that have been going around. Hello, Shaheen. Hi there. Can you hear me? We can. Um, Carsten, um, have you? Yeah, thank you. And have you, can you share your screen, Shaheen? Are you able to? Yeah. Let me share my screen. Let me know when you can see my screen. I can see it black. It's not sure. Black. Presentation. Yeah, it's not loading, but it's black. Uh, just oh, now I can see something. Yes. Is it visible? Yeah. Never look at C unit, everything. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, uh, this is me, Shaheen. I'm gonna present uh, our latest updates, what we did last month and some cool new updates that we have. So moving. On the seed grant side, we have a couple of project updates. Uh, we have this project called Peeps, a very interesting social platform on Cartesi. Uh, what they do is if you are hearing about Peeps for the first time, 
what they do is they register, do all these user registries, post registries uh, on inside Cartesi. They manage this wallet integration. They have this uh, simple tipping kind of feature for the users on Peeps. And you can use this platform. It's live here. Let me just show you. This is the platform. It's live on Arbitrum Sipolia right now. So if you want to test, I'll be dropping the links after this uh, session. And uh, yeah, very interesting kind of like X. Uh, you can peep, repeep, uh, create your user profiles and tip to other users. Next, we have Prism. Uh, Prism, if you guys don't know, Prism is using a generative art model inside a Cartesi machine. They're uh, compiling stable diffusion inside Cartesi. Pretty challenging task, pretty hefty, and uh, they're trying to do that, very determined to do that. And right now they are using Nonodo to run all this, uh, uh, their logic. And this is something, a pixel image that they created. Uh, so the minimum that it requires stable diffusion is like 512 by 512 uh, pixels. So they kind of performed this, and this is like the um, metadata, the base 64 generated for this image that they can get and present a nice visual image. So this is something from this. What is the stable diffusion? Sorry, I'm ignorant oh, on the subject. It's a, it's a model for generative generative AI model that you can use to generate images. Pretty popular. Oh. So, so they have they have used uh, like a pixel art dedicated model for it, and with that pixel art model, they are using to generate this image. Then we have update from the Tikua side. Tikua is a JavaScript framework for backend and frontend for people who want to kickstart like full stack application in JavaScript. This is a very nice platform. It's an npm package as well. They have deployed like uh, at the rate doim slash tikua. And it has some neat features for you to get started on the front end side. You could add listeners for notices, vouchers, and you can check vouchers as per their inputs uh, and notice some sort of uh, filtering functions and uh, more abstractions like the functions we have on the front end side. And it's a good platform. This is something you can check on their GitHub. They have a nice readme, all the functions. So basically, you define an ABI as sort of a format for your backend, and you can directly call those functions, like send input to attack a dragon with your input parameters, and to read uh, whatever the Cartesi machine produced. As I mentioned, you have notices, voucher listeners, and some filtering functions, and some functions related to asset management as well. So again, it would be nice to have feedback on this platform, a uh, very interesting platform for those specifically who are building front ends. Uh, use the platform and uh, give the feedback to Doim guys. Next up in seed grants, we have Greedy Pig. Greedy Pig is a platform, uh, kind of like you roll a dice and bet on the outcome of dice. It has a simple algorithm around it. So you define a winning score, a total winning score, and then two players or more than two players compete to get that winning score. So it uses uh, a commit and reveal scheme, a nice uh, example or a template to refer for commit and reveal scheme for using random number generation inside Cartesi. So if somebody is thinking of uh, building a simple applications around this framework, again, a very nice application to use. Greedy Pig, you can check out the GitHub of Greedy Pig. It also has a, a nice readme for with all the steps that you can use to play the game and build the back end and the front end, and you'll be ready to test it. And then after the seed grants, that was the highlight of the seed grants that we had. Then we had uh, Intelli Masterclass followed by a hackathon, and uh, we had some interesting projects that came out of this hackathon. So let's go through these projects. Some of the cool ones like uh, Cartesi Weather, this was the champion there. And uh, what it does is it's a platform to kind of uh, secure an auditable weather forecasting system, all the information that can be 
uh, audited the data around whether uh, could be uh, used and leveraged via this platform and that could be helped in agricultural investments. So on the tech side, they're using this PyTorch and uh, combined with a LSTM model. And it's again, it's again a very a reusable template that somebody could uh, use and uh, for their own business logic. And they also had this uh, uh, modded sort of a version of their Cartesi CLIs to kind of play with their backend. Uh, very interesting project uh, coming to the heavy tech side of it. Then we had Car Tracker, personally, the project that uh, I like very much. So what Car Tracker is doing, it's um, uh, you have a car and uh, it's bringing the car users, the car owners, the insurance companies and the car manufacturer companies together. So uh, whenever you uh, buy a car and you have any significant events with the car, whether it's an accident or something, and the whole history of that car could be sort of uh, uh, put on chain in a trustable and a verifiable manner. So somebody who is kind of owning this car or buying this car secondhand or for insurance companies as well to verify all this data, it becomes uh, super neat. An interesting thing, like we don't see many applications in Go. Uh, so this application was backend was built in Go uh, using Rollmallet. A very interesting uh, example again. And it's one of those uh, real world examples solving real world problems. Uh, very interesting narrative around that. And uh, yeah, it has a nice UI with all the nice features. You can register uh, companies, the car related incidents, and uh, also verify these incidents later. Then we had Chain Challenge, which kind of uh, looks like Bugbuster, but uh, it's not Bugbuster actually. It's more like a lead code or a code chef uh, competitive programming kind of platform where you could, as a creator, you could create these uh, programming challenges and you could define your test cases uh, and uh, you can let users, uh, coders kind of like uh, complete these uh, test cases and complete these challenges. This could be very much used in uh, like, uh, let's say hiring for people, hiring for uh, hiring for coders. So this kind of platform kind of makes sense there. And again, they had a nice full stack application, which uh, uh, uses like they use Python at the back end. Oh, sorry, this, this is their support right now. They have the support for these languages. You can create challenges with Python, JSTS and Go. Next up, we have Baustamp. Baustamp is uh, trying to target uh, the supply chain management. So supply chain management of uh, apparel products. So you could have t-shirts uh, kind of like products and you could define how that t-shirt is made, the entire journey of that uh, process, and you could have that uh, verifiable on-chain. Not very much intensive on the Cartesi side, but a project again with a good narrative and uh, that uh, helps users verify the things that they are wearing. Also uh, kind of like a, a eco-friendly product, uh, these kind of things uh, suits well uh, with this project. And then we had again, uh, a casino, a card game, a trustless cards. Uh, it won the pool prize and uh, Basically, this project is uh, trying to create a casino game where and they have integrated an interesting thing that we found was the chain link integration. And uh, it's a great POC to explore if you want to see the chain link inter integration with Cartesi. And if you want to build more casino games like this, it's a reusable kind of a platform and application. And apart from that, what else we have? We have in-house two applications going on, Mimbat and Playground. Uh, you'll be seeing more of updates on these applications in coming recap meetings or on Discord. Then we had uh, participation from the DevAt team in the experiment week on different applications, Comet, Noozle, Date Linux, or whatever its name was. No extra, Blockagochi, Sequencer, 
we started podcast i build therefore i am we had our first podcast with volum interesting uh, inspiration and interesting journey of uh, vilam we explored in that po- podcast and udemy v2 is coming so now we have uh, cartesi cli earlier it was sonodo we have replaced that with cartesi so a whole master class designed around that we are giving more light uh, to some tools that we have polished a lot like uh, explorer so you'll be seeing more of explorer we'll be dropping udemy course soon and yeah more master classes in the way so watch out for those that's pretty much it cool and fast paced again people need to think a bit <laughs> now and formulate their questions please do um any anything that you think about uh, uh asking about these all these very very uh diverse projects from ai stuff to uh convenience tooling i have a couple of questions again but uh please do people uh place them there on the chat All right. Um thanks Shahin. Let's move now to the Rives team which has some news to share I guess. Carlo if you could come to the stage. Thank you. Hey guys, can you hear me? We can. Okay, share your screen just a second. Uh are you guys able to see the screen or not? Yeah, it's there. Beautiful as always. Cool. Let's uh, start guys. So the recap, really busy month, multiple stuff. Uh, just an overview for the ones that don't know Rise yet. So Rise is this on-chain, verifiable fantasy console. It's built on uh, Cartesia. It's an app chain. And uh, it's deterministic because it's based on the Cortez machine, right? So everything that happens inside, no matter how crazy, it's going to be deterministic and verifiable on chain. So overview of the month, uh, we had multiple application optimizations. So a lot of stuff is faster, uh, works better, uh, lower uh, latency. UX improvements. Uh, we also had on the community side uh, an endcopter contest. This one was YOLO, so you only live once. Uh, unlike the other one, in which uh, going faster was more important. On this one, it was taking your time, being precise on collecting berries, because uh, only one life, so you can only die. We had a couple of new cartridges, uh, so the toy sequencer, which I'm going to show uh, later on to aid you on making music and also a toy drawing canvas uh, which is also nice to make some pixelated art we have this new landing page which is very cool i'm gonna showcase it as well a uh, couple of improvements on documentation such as new guides we also were part of the experimentation week so we had on three different initiatives uh, we had lino uh, spearheading uh, composability uh, experiment, which was really cool. It's, uh, it's a great way for scaling a bit Cartes computations, also uh, not having to update uh, very often because then you can update selectively since uh, you have different depths on, on the parts of your system. We also made an experiment with uh, DeFi. So I was part of a team that made this uh, uh, landing uh, protocol risk analysis inside of Cartesia using uh, an AI model, also cool. And we also had Eduardo doing uh, something that I think everyone heard of, uh, this uh, very cool way of executing an LLM natively and speeding it up like uh, over 100 times. So super nice. And I also want to show a sneak peek on uh, some uh, changes we're doing in our, on our UX. So this is just a quick uh, gameplay of the YOLO contest. So uh, the guy's taking his time, is being uh, more careful than usual, wants to collect berries, that's the objective. That's just to illustrate this, this contest. If you guys want to give it a try, you can also play, but uh, it's, it's non-competitive any longer because the, t- the contest is done. 
Now, the Toy Sequencer. Uh, this is really cool. So we have this cartridge in which you can compose music. Can you guys hear the notes, by the way? We, we can't hear it, but it looks, looks super nice, though. Yeah, so it's really easy. You can just put the notes in there on, on the fly and it plays the notes for you. You can increase or decrease the relative volume. You can shift the notes. You have different uh, um, different instruments, so strings, bass, drums, a lot of stuff. And this is me just doing something really simple and bad because I'm terrible at music. But if you get better at it, you can do something like what I did. So on our Discord, there are like 10 tracks that he did. And this one is actually pretty nice. Very cool, man. So yeah, if you're talented, you can do some really amazing music uh, with really low effort. Another really cool stuff. Can you just recap what, what is the, the the idea here? Yeah, so when you're doing games in Rives, music is kind of uh, a part of the soul of the game, right? Right. And, right. and making music is kind of hard. So uh, we do have the API in which you can just uh, uh, determine the waveform that you want, uh, the pitch, the duration, all the stuff. But it's kind of hard to picture it and to iterate over it. So this one is, is a very nice interactive graphical tool in which you can just design sounds uh, in a way more uh, dynamic fashion, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it is it is a cartridge as well? It is a cartridge as well, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> very funny. Okay. And, uh, well, this one, I was drawing, so actually a quick, uh, quick recap on why this happened. I was actually using this interface to draw. And I was trying to come up with something that sounded nice, though it was a drawing. And then Bartel got kind of pissed and said, yeah, this is not for drawing. And uh, then he made this. So this is a, a, a toy drawing canvas. So you can also use to, to make some uh, pixelated art for your games and stuff. It's super simple, but super nice and straightforward to use. So you have the selection uh, colors on the bottom. You can uh, color pick. Uh, you can... Uh, Basically, do this this uh, this drawings really fast, right? So this is just drawing that I, I made just uh, a couple of hours ago. Super simple, uh, like uh, I'd say, not even uh, I'd, I'd say preschool level. But yeah, you can have some fun. You can draw some stuff, and it's also a tool that you can use uh, to aid you on making your games, right? If you want to do some sprites for your for your character, and if you're in your game, you can use this, uh, export the tape, and later on import it. And then uh, we also updated the, the landing page of Rive, so it's much cooler. The thing you see on the center displaying the capabilities of Rive, uh, like a commercial, it's actually a tape, uh, a cartridge, sorry, made by Eduardo. So uh, I think we're getting really mad in here. <laughs> we're making everything become a cartridge, but uh, it's cool. And yeah. So on this new landing page, uh, you can also just check a couple of uh, tapes and also play a couple of games in there. Right. Yeah, it doesn't have the, all the functionality that arrives, but it's meant for someone that's just checking it for the first time to have a taste, right? So we have a couple of games you can play, and also you can select a couple of tapes to replay. So this is Lucky, the one that uh, won our game jam. It's a pretty cool, uh, kind of bejeweled kind of game. And of course, you can play a couple of tapes in there. So this one is a is a guy playing Doom, for instance. And yeah, uh, besides that, uh, we also have a new profile uh, page uh, incoming. So that shows your tapes, uh, the ones you collected, your cartridges, your activity, the contest you were in, this kind of stuff. It's still a work in progress, so uh, next update, is, it's it's probably going to be improved, uh, possibly also ready. And we also have this uh, new home for the application itself, which we're devising. So it's going to show the latest cartridges, uh, the latest tapes, 
the contests that are live and a couple of stats like uh, the number of cartridges in the system, number of tapes that uh, exist. And then from there, you can go to the more specific features like uh, displaying all the cartridges, all the contests, all the tapes, uploading your own cartridges, this kind of stuff. So yeah, guys, uh, I think I rushed a bit, but uh, this is an overall of what we did. It's super cool if you guys feel like uh, simulated and excited about making your own games. Uh, I suggest you head down to DocsRives.io. Uh, feedback from the people that have developed uh, cartridges up to now is that in like one or two days, they're able to kickstart their project and do uh, some simple version of a game or other experiment. So uh, I do urge you guys to uh, go there and just start creating something that you think is nice, either art or a game. Just go there and give yourself uh, a moment to express yourself. And if you're not on Rise community, please do join. You can scan this QR code and it's gonna head you there. And that's it, guys. Uh, lovely to be here. And uh, yeah, see you next month. Carlo, just stay there for a bit. I think sure. I'll do backtracking. So I'll start with the questions uh, for you, and then mm -hmm. I'll go to Shahid, and then back to Carson. Um, there was a question from Filippi Soku. Any chance that we load uh, Pico 8 cartridges to Rives? So directly, no, because we have a different API, but the API of Rives is uh, heavily inspired on Pico 8. So it's super easy for you to port. So you can pick up a Pico 8 game and just uh, change the the calls that uh, draw on the screen, play sounds to the one of, on the Rise API, and uh, you should be able to do that really, really fast. Doom itself was a port by, by Bartel, so he just uh, did the same thing, right? But it's harder because the, the API used by Doom, it's it's not uh, as similar to the, to the Rise as the Pico 8 one is. If if there's a lot of demand, do you think there could be some sort of automation for that porting or, or not really, right? Uh, if you say it three times, probably that will implement it. <laughs> okay. So, Filippi and, and others, if you really want to port these kinds of games, just do it and then something will happen. Um... I think I had, uh, uh, yeah, I had another question for you, Carlo. Uh, the toy sequencer in particular, but also the, the toy drawing, drawing converse, the idea was just to have fun there, or say there's some, uh, like, it helps you to already import that into your game. Like, the, 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 the sequencer that you do, since it's, it's, it's not, I mean, if you did it in some other software, you would need to go through some steps maybe to include it in the game and this helps you to to compose something that already is in in a proper format and is even more easily included in the game or something like that so uh when you're making a game you can either directly draw on the screen with geometric figures or or dots or text or you can use sprites right and then sprites uh, there are uh, multiple ways for you to obtain them so there are a lot of uh, very uh, skilled artists that make those for sale or even uh, or even Creative Commons open. You can just uh, go there and, and use. Or you can design your own. And then uh, you can use traditional image uh, uh, edition tools, like uh, anything simple like Paintbrush or a bit more complex like Inkscape. And you can draw your sprites. There are... Uh, Advanced tooling just for that. So as Fright, for instance, it's a open source program that is pretty complex, but for the ones that uh, know how to use it, it's, it's re really efficient, helps you animate and all the stuff. But if you're getting started, you've never done it and stuff, then it's kind of uh, overwhelming. So you can just use this cartridge. It doesn't have advanced capabilities. It's literally select a color of the palette that's limited. Uh, move the cursor around and start drawing, right? So anyone can just get started in a couple of seconds here. Uh, no need to study, no need to figure things out. It's just uh, intuitive. Okay. So yeah, that's the idea. But the output is just the same as it would be with some other 
Really? Yeah, the output is a tape, and then we're working on making uh, tapes uh, inputs for other for other uh, cartridges, right? So mm. uh, the music should be an input for other cartridge. This uh, the sprites could be also an input. So yeah, it's something we're working towards. Okay, cool. Um, there are no any other questions for Carlo. Oh, Fabio, <laughs> Fabio was asking, is, is it a toy or is it a tool? It is a, it, it is a really simple tool. So we, uh, Eduardo likes to call it uh, toy toy X. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, we're still integrating these features, so as here. Cool. I think this is has just become a popular feature. Yeah, let's see. But for the moment, you can just go there, go crazy, and and share your creations on on Discord. Cool. Very nice stuff. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Carlo. So um, I can backtrack to, to Shaheem. I have a couple of questions. Please, people, do. There was a lot of stuff that Shaheem talked about. You can feel free to ask some, some questions. Uh, one question that I had, Shaheem, was about the Kua. Um, it's, it's on top of the role or something else uh, to start with. It's, it's more geared towards front end, right? Yeah, so the backend, I believe Philippe is also here, Tikua creator. <laughs> so the backend is based on Dero. He and they're using Dero for for that. But the front end is pretty standalone in itself. So mm -hmm. yeah, does it for... use any any specific JavaScript framework like React or something? Or is it based on 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 some or even no, no, like no. Uh, blockchain? Uh, uh, Frameworks like VM or something. Oh, okay. so it's uh, it's it's pretty flexible. Not not like a, a framework based. Correct me if I'm wrong, Philippi. Uh, you can use it with different frameworks, JavaScript frameworks, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's not very uh, limited to any specific framework or any any specific, uh, let's say, providers or something. That's very interesting, and and also so he, uh, Philippe just asked uh, answered like that. This uh, the role is not required. It's it's they're strongly recommended, but you can use it without the role. Looks like. And uh, also, I imagine that you're you're not you can use ethers or VM or, or whatever you want as well for for blockchain interaction, right? Because that's yeah. that's correct. Uh I mean, uh, they have functions there, and you can use any any utility library uh, if you want. Oh, very nice. This looks like something that will will be a lot of help. I've, I've heard some other from other projects that one of their biggest difficulties was exactly the front end development. Um, they did use the uh, front end web uh, template. Yes. And I believe it was Lino who produced it first, um, but they 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 wanted more flexibility. They wanted uh, they didn't want to use TypeScript in their project, and they had some difficulties there until they finally got, got their heads around it. So, yeah, exactly. I think Tikua uh, Tikua combined with Drol for JavaScript developers, it's like a really nice stack to build Cartesian applications. Very nice. Um, another question that I had was about the Katezi weather uh, project. Was is that like long term, like climate prediction for? Because you mentioned it was for agriculture investment, so I was wondering if it was like more of a long term climate thing, like the the next next spring it will rain more or less than the average, uh, or it's more of a short term. Uh, forecast. Okay, uh, I don't have like, exact details for that, but I believe they are what they're doing right now. Yeah, Marcus can help me. Marcus was right there with those guys. <laughs> Come on in, Marcus. Hey guys, are you hearing me? Yeah, we can. Yep. 
Yeah, uh, courtesy writer. Uh, quick, simple uh, about that. They it's a short term prediction because of the data they worked on, but the framework they created can be used for anything like uh, long term. It, it depends on the data they create, but for the POC itself, it's more or less on the short term. Okay. Yeah, but since it talks about agricultural investment, I thought it would be something yeah. that made for like longer term stuff. So. Yeah, I, I I think the 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 database they created they use it on the on the book example is more or less for the it was a I think it was a short term but uh, it it all it all depends on the yeah the model predict up to uh, a bunch of hours ahead so okay yeah cool. Thanks, guys. 140 <laughs> hours ahead. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Anybody else has any question about all the all the projects, chain challenge, and things like that? Yeah, just want to mention these projects are you would find these projects in Spotlight, and you would find the uh, seed guarantee updates in the ecosystem updates as well. So. If you don't have any questions now, you can ask anytime. All right. The cool thing I like is the stack used more than the use case itself. Okay. All right. Thanks, Shaheen. Thanks a Thank lot. you. Um, all right, so Carson, would you care to come up stage and talk more about um, eigenlayer and co processors? There's a lot of stuff to unwrap there. Um, one thing that crosses my mind uh, often is that the slashing thing where we could use Dave for that. So first thing that I would like to ask, I'm not sure, I mean, it's not a question for you, it's just uh, your 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 feeling about uh, how far slashing is uh, on the eigenlayer side of things. I mean, it's something that they've been talking about, something that could come like early next year, or or, or what do you think? Uh, so, so definitely like eigenlayer has, has put out like uh, the stuff around this inter-subjective kind of like Icon token kind of like thing, and uh, the, the the paper is so immense that that I think that I need a glass of wine at the beach to get through it. So it's a little unclear. Let's say when they actually get slash again, they were originally talking about veto community uh, committee uh, of kind of like trusted members of the Ethereum community to kind of go ahead and let's say be the last Supreme Court for slashing. Because the thing in Icon there is that that you don't. You don't slash straight away, right? You freeze an operator in this particular case. And that kind of like changes around a little bit, like like how you do things, because you kind of need to provide enough evidence to, let's say, freeze the assets to some extent that they can kind of like withdraw them. But then the actual, let's say, completion of this can take longer time. Uh, so I think right now they're working mostly on rewards because obviously people who are restaking their value in the system want to get some kind of yield on things. So I think that's where they're focusing on first, because if they don't have happy paid uh, stakers, then they don't have a system, right? Uh, but uh, I really think that, that at this particular point, uh, even let's say having a large amount of cryptographic value that has some kind of reputational risk or even monetary risk uh, helps quite a lot to kind of like help decide uh, a system where uh, what we are doing is that we are kind of like, let's say, starting a little early uh, by, let's say, just having a single operator, having something that, that's easy to use, then adding more security over time, essentially, as these kind of things become more defined and ready, and kind of showing that, that hey, a lot of problems out there are much easier if you can run it using Linux VM, and you don't need to sacrifice code to do it. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so on, on the rewarding thing, I was under the impression that each each uh, system would do its own rewarding of sorts, but 
So there's some plans yeah. of, of like a global framework for rewarding? Uh, they, they, they have something that kind of like testing out on the testnet at the moment, but I don't have good visibility into it. But in general, obviously, if you're doing some work for a network, uh, some work for a network, then uh, you obviously want to be paid somehow. So uh, it's then the system is not let's say necessarily between let's say the user and the system in this particular case is between uh, the operator and its stakers in this particular case because obviously you want to restake your value with operators that uh, sure. that actually let's say give you a good uh, let's say share of the rewards right yeah but, 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 but where, where, where I find this interesting is that, that um, a lot of the times we're going to fall a little bit into this trap that, that uh, we need to understand how everything works in fraud proofs. And I think that sometimes, in many use cases, a core processor will suffice. So uh, this is kind of like why we want to kind of out there and get early into the space and do something useful here. Because like uh, in this thread that I've linked originally in the... And uh, chat basically, there's a there's a kind of soft spot in between very simple computation and ZK computation, uh, uh, where basically when it gets large enough, then basically it doesn't make any kind of economic sense to do ZK anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, and and just recap. So the idea is that um, you would finalize uh, quickly with without fraud proofs or anything, and then. At some later point, you could slash uh, the majority that voted for that using some mm -hmm. kind of, of, of proof system, right? Yes. Uh, basically, it's a little bit like uh, a kilo guillotine coming from before you afterwards, like in the French Revolution, okay. essentially. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so another question that you mentioned, I thought it was very interesting. So one thing that I'm not sure everybody is familiar with, there's there is this integration going on um, between uh, the Cartesi CLI and Lambada projects, and, and you are basing the coprocessor on Lambada, right? So basically, the idea is that you could um, build applications much in the same way of, as every, everybody's been building for Cartesi rollup. So you, Cartesi build, Cartesi run for testing, but and uh, Cartesi deploy, etc. Cartesi create. And uh, the API would be very similar, if not if not identical. And uh, and I thought it was very so. Cartesi send, which is usually sending an input to a rollups application, would actually be um, defining a compute job to be run on a coprocessor. Would would that be be it? The idea of Cartesi send? Yeah, I mean, I think that's basically the idea here because we have this in Lambda. We have a compute API endpoint. In, in where you specify a particular IPFS CID, which is a function that you put along with payload. So basically, it just is like, uh, usually, you basically would see the logs of that, that computation being done at that particular point. Uh, so it makes for a very nice development experience for it, in my opinion, uh, of course. Uh, but also, it's worth noting that, that because it's a Lambada chain, a corpus as a function is essentially one that doesn't describe what, let's say, sequence it belongs to. So there's no differences in the API between, let's say, a rollup and a corpus as a function. It's just that it just gets called once with a state, and you can have a haplic state is something that has to happen, happen externally. And uh, Cartesi send could potentially be used for testnet and mainnet as well, right? You could just send of course. something to. Right. I guess that's all from my side. Does anybody have that? There are lots of stuff that people could ask about. Um, does anybody there want to ask some questions to Carson about Aguilera coprocessors? You mentioned like subsampling. Um, maybe that's something that we could explore a little bit more as well. Um, I believe like if you have it would be something related to payment, probably, right? Do you want to pay less to have less operators participating in, in that particular computation because you don't need all that security, something like that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, if you have a good random source, you basically can go out and can like do this, uh, like a weighted random sampling uh, of the operators that are out there. So it is still secure enough. 
to some extent, provided that you assume that the two thirds are kind of like honest and the individual nodes are still kind of like being slashed if they do something wrong. Uh, but one of the interesting properties of this is that we can essentially build subsampling uh, because we have access to the Ethereum history. We can build the subsampling as a, a thing running inside the echo processor task itself, right? So kind of like have multiple kind of like jobs uh, being handled. So we don't need, they need to necessarily implement all the subsampling on contract level directly. Wait a minute. You're talking about one uh, thing using the other. Oh, it would go back to the base layer. Yeah. Okay. It's because this is because this, this is layer, the thing right? that yeah because this is the thing that 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 if you go to the base layer, you kind of want to have let's say all the nodes, right? But let's say what that, that like you want to have all the new operators in the icon layer in this particular case. But what you can do is uh, essentially implement the extra functionality of the system. Uh, that you normally would have put into a smart contract, you can obviously put that inside the system itself. Since it's, so, it finalizes very fast, right? That's the idea. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah. also, it, it makes it substantially less complex to implement because normally, let's say, you need to have access to a lot of things. And because we can read the exact same data and the exact same signatures and sits, sits on the Ethereum history or in the, the blockchain, in the process itself, we can basically extend the coprocessor contract using the coprocessor itself. Which is something you use a pre-image oracle stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah. I just still a little bit unsure. I have to confess about the restaking and restaking. If, if you finalize fast and you kind of compose these things on one on top of the other, at some point, if somebody is really I mean, yeah, you you and but but every time it goes back, it goes to different operators, right? So yeah. Yeah, well, it, it kind of like depends on how you build the system out. But in general, like um, this is why I think it is important for us to kind of start up with something almost completely stupid when it comes to almost like testing production, because then we can test out these things early instead of building a huge big system to do this. Yeah, I was just wondering what happens in like in this scenario that. Part of the system decided on, on the on the sampling, and then that many many levels of that. What happens when some stake is slashed, like a week ago or a month ago? <laughs> then what yeah, happens to the rest of the world? Then? Yeah. <laughs> so this is what we can try to find out how these systems actually work. That's a question on Angular itself, right? How this restaking and restaking will play out. All right. Very cool. So I guess this is it. Any final questions, people? All right. Thanks a lot to everybody who presented and attended. Um, and see you next time. <laughs>